Okay, welcome everybody to the first of our two special Meet the Researchers events. This is part of our big get together month. For those that don't know me, I'm Phil Steele, I'm Head of Alumni Engagement and I'm really pleased that you could join us today. Now the idea of our big get together month was really to bring the alumni and the university community together to share and celebrate our commitment to work in sustainability, particularly around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and goal two, zero hunger, is the one that's particularly relevant today. Although our alumni aren't able to physically get together at the moment, and we're not able to bring people together on campus, the closest we can come is that photo of the Parkinson Tower behind me. Um, what we can still do is to bring the community together through our digital channels. And in many ways, this gives us an opportunity to broaden the audience for our events um, across the world. Um, as we think about our role in sustainable development. To see more of what the university and our alumni worldwide are doing in this area at the moment, do remember to follow Leeds Alumni on social media if you're not already, and in particular, to search on the hashtag LeedsBGT20 um, and to visit our website as well. And we'll be posting the links to that in the chat. Um, so you can really get a feel for some of the stories about Leeds research and what our alumni are doing in, in the fields of sustainable development. Um, please do also, if you can make it, uh, join our event tomorrow as well, um, where Professor Caroline Orfila will discuss mapping the Leeds urban food system. And if you haven't booked already, we'll put a link to that in the, in the chat. This uh, format is a first for us, so we're really keen to get the feedback from you to help us shape our digital event programme in the future. Uh, so after this webinar is over, we will be in touch to get your thoughts and your feedback. It probably goes without saying, but I will say that uh, while we hope there won't be any technical challenges, please do bear with us if they do arise. We are developing our digital capability and our experience as we go on, and it's great to have you here at the start of it. Uh, in terms of how this webinar is going to work, it'll take the form of a presentation and there will then be the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the chat function at the bottom of your screens uh, to post questions and we'll go through as many as we can do in the time we have available. Um, you can type questions at any point during the presentation and we'll bank them and then we'll come to them all and go through them at the end. I'd now like to introduce our speaker, Professor Stephen Banwart. Steve holds the University of Leeds Leadership Chair in Integrated Soil, Agriculture and Water Research and is a director of the Global Food and Environment Institute here. You may well have read something about his research in our most recent magazine and it's a pleasure to hear from him today. Welcome everybody, um, I'm Steve Banwart. Uh, today, I will lay out a series of challenges for global food supply in the 21st century, and I will provide a positive vision for the future and a pathway to navigate through these challenges. The four decades from 2010 going forward to the future in 2050 have been described as a perfect storm of converging global demands for natural resources that support global food supplies. During this time, human population is expected to reach 10 billion people with an accompanying growth in wealth and resource demands. There is a projected quadrupling of the global economy with intense urbanization with 75% of the world's population living in cities by 2050. There will be a more than doubling in demand for food and fuel a more than 50% increase in the demand for clean water, and the demand for productive agricultural land will be 10 to 45% greater projected need than Earth's environmental capacity. We will have to meet these demands while navigating the need to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of a changing climate. I want to say that humanity will navigate this storm and we will pass through to the other side. But this raises important and difficult questions. What is the path forward? What are the costs and changes that will be required? 
And what does our landing place look like on the other side of 2050 and beyond? A forward glimpse of a positive outcome is starting to come into view. This includes future food systems that deliver nutrition and health, not just calories, farming methods, that actively restore soil, water, and biodiversity, as well as supply food, a carbon neutral, circular agricultural and food supply chain economy that recovers resources, and novel methods of farming that adapt to and help reverse the impacts of climate change. In the future, our vision is that food supplies will be restorative not only supplying food, but reversing what are now historical declines in rural population and livelihoods, in dietary health, and in environmental quality. The University of Leeds faces these challenges with determination. We have a sense of urgency and we have confidence to step onto the world stage and provide leadership. We are a global university based in a rich agricultural region. We have the strength and diversity of talent on campus for new knowledge and invention that is based here, but with the potential for positive influence and market share worldwide. This creates both regional and global opportunity to strengthen farm value beyond the currently stagnant average income for UK farms, to diversify crops to include novel plant protein sources to improve farming incomes in the face of flatlining global commodity prices, to improve farming efficiency to reduce pressure on and ex of pressures of extending currently agricultural land into marginally productive land, as an example into the Amazon basin thereby protecting these natural habitats and their biodiversity. Opportunities to improve crop genetics to reduce the demand for irrigation water and mineral fertilizer that come with high carbon emissions from pumping water, from manufacturing mineral nitrogen, from mining rock phosphate and rock potash. Opportunities to improve efficiency to reduce chemical application rates and pollution, reducing farming greenhouse gas emissions, and protect farming from future climate change. To engage a circular economy that recycles organic nutrients from farm waste and urban wastewater and mineral nutrients from mining and construction waste and bring them back to land, thereby reducing mineral fertilizer demand, replacing soil organic matter that sequesters carbon from greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere and that regenerates soil fertility. To achieve this, the University of Leeds draws on the Global Food and Environment Institute to provide academic leadership that focuses research and innovation priorities and draws together the necessary teams to collaborate on solutions. We have a strong vision from the university senior executive team that is accompanied with substantial investment and academic leaders that translates into strategy and delivery that drives our success. We have great academic strength we are ranked first in the UK for agriculture, forestry, and food in the Guardian League tables. We are top 15 in the world for earth and marine sciences, top 20 in geography, and top 50 in environmental sciences. There is substantial new investment in the Global Food and Environment Institute, most importantly, through funding from our faculties for new academic staff that are working together. Our 350 hectare commercial University of Leeds farm hosts the National Pig Research Center and is being developed into a globally unique digitally connected smart farm. A key priority on drawing on this globally unique combination of strengths is defining what farming and food supply must look like in 2050 and beyond, providing complete nutrition with net zero emissions, no waste, and capturing the full value of farming. We want to show you how we are achieving this. The University of Leeds Farm hosts the National Pig Research Center, and this is funded as part of the UK Agritech Center for Innovation and Excellence in Livestock, noted as CL. 
This includes a 12 million pound capital investment in state-of-the-art facilities for livestock research that are shown here, that are shown here on this slide. This includes the Nigel Bertram Center, Visitor Center to welcome guests to the site and host conferences, workshops, and meetings. And CL anchors the site-wide development of the University Farm as a combined agricultural teaching, research, and commercial innovation facility. The University of Leeds is a national leader in pig nutrition research through the work of Professor Helen, Helen Miller, who founded the National Pig Research Center as part of CL. There is also the Pig Sustain Project led by Professor Lisa Collins, developing and testing technology to enable the transition to sustainable livestock production. Some of the advances include digital technology to precision monitor the pig herd and adjust production conditions such as inside environment and diet. Connection to digital supply chain tracking to follow the food supply from the point of production on the farm through processing and distribution to the point of retail and to add value in the retail market by clearly accounting for high standards of animal welfare and the environmental benefits of novel farming methods. This new research considers the circular economy and how to gain energy and nutrients from waste and to help close the loop towards carbon neutral agriculture. Professor Collins also leads the Climate Pig Project it is pilot research that examines the impacts of changing climate on outdoor livestock production, particularly the future impact of extreme weather events. It applies precision tacking and tracking of pigs to adapt to mineral animal welfare, the health and energy conversion efficiency to reduce the impacts of extreme weather in outdoor livestock production. It also monitors soil and water impacts of extreme weather such as the influence of storms on manure runoff from fields into streams and groundwater aquifers. This is to help guide managing rotations to retain nutrients in the soil and prevent pollution emissions to water bodies. There is a three million pound capital investment in environmental observing instrument, instrumentation and digital technology to track environmental fluctuations and link these to on-farm decisions. For weather forecasting, we use a widely distributed network of atmospheric and land surface sensors that produce data streams for real-time forecasts of weather. This is the typical work of the Met Office of the UK and other weather services around the world. However, we are transforming these methods to include satellite imaging of Earth's surface, monitoring soil and groundwater conditions, tracking atmospheric chemistry, and crop responses. We will be able to forecast not just the weather, but the influences of environmental fluctuations on crop growth, guiding agrochemical applications, and testing the practices that can reduce the cost overheads and cut pollution. We aim to push the boundaries of digital technology with control systems and robotics, autonomous vehicles for field work to till, plant, and harvest and manage livestock. With these advances in tracking of conditions and operations on the ground, together with forecasting methods and greater automation, we will be able to produce more and healthier food on less land with less chemicals. We can reduce the environmental emissions and lower the risk from climate change and create far greater farm value. The Future Crops initiatives, Initiative harnesses fundamental biology to maximize the genetic potential of new crops to aid the transition to the future farm of 2050. This innovation at the biological level will address the complex challenge of improving genetics in fluctuating environmental conditions and variable agricultural management practices. All of these must be developed together and cannot be addressed in isolation. This is the incredible value of having a research farm to host such research. These improvements are also for water and nutrient use efficiency of crop plants to adapt farming to future conditions of potentially lower rainfall to help reduce inputs of fertilizer and expand the range of crops available to farm income to produce new, and food, new food ingredients for human consumption. This is to target the nutritional value of crops and maximize the content of specific types of plant fiber, oil content, or for example, as new sources of plant milk for human consumption. 
Future crops will enable industrial collaboration on gene edited crops together with testing at the university farm to debug innovation under commercial farming conditions. Through this work, we will enable greater diversity of crops and income streams, reduce chemical inputs to farming, and improve the nutritional value of food. The capital investment in digital observing systems enables the University of Leeds research farm to be developed as a digitally connected smart farm. Observing systems track environmental conditions of the atmosphere, vegetation, soil, drainage streams, and groundwater. It will be able to link these to precision monitoring of livestock and tracking of farming practices. This information will feed into supply chain tracking technology. These data streams will be able to guide farming decisions and business planning throughout the supply chain. This offers a platform to support farming and food education, research from undergraduate education, and through master's and doctoral training. It includes academic research and partnership with industry for commercial innovation and testing. We are incredibly excited to have the opportunity to develop this capability within the rich agricultural production region of Yorkshire and the north of England. We see operations to innovate locally and to lead globally. The Global Food and Environment Institute works worldwide. We have major global partnerships in Africa, East Asia, and the Americas. Here are two examples. AFRICAP is an eight million pound project to future-proof African agriculture and food supply to climate change. It is funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, a major program which draws on the UK's international aid budget to help the world's poorest regions through innovation. We are also helping reshape fertilizer use in China. It is double the application rate in Europe. It causes enormous greenhouse gas emissions of nitrous oxides from soil and from the energy demand and carbon footprint of mineral fertilizer production. It is also causing the loss of fertilizer as runoff pollution to rivers and groundwater drinking supplies. To prevent environmental and human health risks and to meet international obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we work with key partners in China on research to replace mineral fertilizer with organic fertilizer from agriculture and urban waste streams. The University of Leeds is tackling major global challenges and creating solutions that will able, enable transformations, not only in Yorkshire and the UK, but worldwide. This is the final slide of my presentation. I hope that I've been able to give you a glimpse of a positive future and some examples of pathways forward. In closing, our aim at University of Leeds and the Global Food and Environment Institute is to transform the future by hothousing creativity and through transformative education programs. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you, Steve, for that presentation. We have a few questions uh, to put to you now from the audience. Before we do that, I, I, I had a couple of questions myself. I suppose my first one, which is speaking as a, as, as a Leeds graduate, as well as, um, as, as a member of the, the, the university staff, um, you've talked in, in a lot of detail there about all, all the expertise and resource that Leeds has. I wondered if there was, uh, you know, a particular reason to ask why, why Leeds has ended up with with such a such a, a speciality, such a, such a, an amount of of expertise. Kind of why what why Leeds is 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 in such a position that it is. So I I came to Leeds about four years ago with the brief to develop the Global Food and Environment Institute and to pull these different strands of excellence together to work on the, this type of research and innovation agenda that I described today. And some of the incredible strengths that I've had to work with coming into the university at that time is at our absolutely world leading strengths in certain areas, in particular, atmospheric sciences and climate. Um, we're in the top 10 globally in that area. We have uh, the UK's top food science and nutrition department, 
And then we had in our Faculty of Biological Sciences, we had the National Pig Research Center and very strong livestock and plant sciences research. Uh, alongside that, but not yet working on agriculture and environment too much, were areas such as artificial intelligence and electrical engineering and sensor development in our Faculty of Engineering. And we've been able to bring some of their expertise applied in manufacturing and biomedical uh, applications into the environmental and agricultural sector. And so it was and the ability to have uh, certain core strengths, but then to create a framework and a set of activities that bring them into collaboration and working together. So those, let's say, were the components that were available, and those are the parts that are now working together in this area. That's great, thank you. I'm going to save my second question because actually it's, it's come up in the chat already, so we'll come to it in a second. Great. So um, just running through the, the questions that have come from our, our audience in the, in the chat, um, and I'll take, I'll take them in the order that they, they came through to us. Um, the first one we got from, from Andrew Jenkins, who Andrew um, is an agricultural engineer um, and visiting fellow at Cambridge University. And, and Andrew's question um, is that, um, he says last year he attended a, an FAO sponsored seminar in Dakar on the strategic development goals with, with keynote by the planning commission chair. And he says he has been working in, in Hanoi on, on the this 10th goal, which I think is, is about reducing inequality within and among countries. Mm. So his, his question is, um, in terms of uh, well, what, what he thinks um, and felt that, that the reducing inequality within and among countries um, was really important here um, and was a priority. What do you think? So one of the things that you, you those of you who are, who are with us today will, will recognize from my accent that, that I'm not uh, Yorkshire born and bred. I have a Yorkshire visa by marriage. Um, but as a, a, an honorary uh, adopted Yorkshireman, one of the things that I'm incredibly proud of is the UK's legal uh, obligation and commitment to spending 0.7% of GDP in international development. And that I think uh, you know is a starting point. We'd like to see all G7, um, you know, committing legally to that that type of investment. Now, taking advantage of that, the other thing that the UK. So, I mean, I agree with this point of reducing inequality both within and between countries. Uh, I support that agenda fully. I think the AfriCap project that I, man I mentioned on the global partnership slide is a really good example of that. Um, and the way that that is working is that we have at Leeds, one of our strengths in our uh, particularly earth sciences area has been a commitment and a very strong track record over the last decade and a half in working with our Department for International De Development in the UK on international development, particularly around natural resources and around agriculture. So we have very long standing uh, partnerships in particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the AfriCap project, that is driven by the Fanapan Think Tank, uh, which is a, a policy development and African across multiple African nations, identifying policy innovation, tackle challenges, and um, inequality uh, in livelihoods and uh, access to agricultural resources and access to food is one of the areas, one of their priority areas. And they have developed the agenda uh, that we then partner with them on in helping develop this in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is about, in addressing these inequalities, thinking about not only what are some of the sources of inequality today and mechanisms to help change that, but then looking ahead 20, 30 years down, down the road, where we want, um, what, what we want to, to see uh, farmers and, and uh, those who use food, need food, where we want them to be, and then how to start shaping conditions now to not only address current inequalities, but move this whole, move the whole, the whole scene forward in a way that, that um, addresses these inequalities as it goes along. And this is, you know, one of the things that we can offer through partners like Fanapan is access to the types of expertise that Leeds and its African university partners have and make that available 
much more widely within country. Um, that, that is, is one mechanism that, that we have available to us that we're using to address uh, the challenges that Andrew noted. Thank you, Steve. The, the next question is um, one of a couple more around smart farming in particular. So the question is, to what extent do you think such smart farming methods that you talked about will affect changes to our landscape? So we, uh, at present, um, you know, there is a lot of the technology which can be done without huge infrastructure, let's say physical infrastructure development, not beyond the current imposition of uh, uh, masts for digital communications, uh, you know, signal transfer, transmission. Um, so I think that on the ground, I think that the landscapes uh, do not necessarily immediately look dramatically different. However, I think that some of these changes that I alluded to, to achieve this more efficient, more, more um, you know, multi-objective farming in the future that's being restorative towards the environment in addition to being more effective and more efficient in food production, um, you know, this, this will, you know, I imagine that we will see different types of crop rotations. We won't see hillsides in Yorkshire covered solely with wheat and rapeseed and other rotations, potato crops, but we may see other vegetation cropping in. It will have different uh, blooming at different times. It will have different color to the landscape. So I think there will be, uh, you know, the potential for aesthetic change in the landscape driven, driven by these objectives. But what we hope is that by having observing systems in place with the crops and within the landscape, that we will get better information about, you know, the environmental effects of farming and how crops and livestock interacting with environmental conditions will help us guide the environmental outcomes that we want. And this may well include, you know, understanding much better how hedgerows are interacting with crops and do we need lay strips until stretches of land projecting out into our fields to extend some of the hedgerow biodiversity out into cropland, things of that nature. Um, so there can be changes, but I don't see the landscape looking dramatically more industrial. Um, but then, uh, things can change rapidly, and we'll see as these developments, you know, are adopted more widely by the farming community. That's great, thank you. And and to follow on from that, um, one question about how how we how Leeds influences the policy side as well. So what what what's Leeds doing to influence governments to adapt some of the innovations you talked about and businesses to do things differently? So I think one of the things that the research farm, such as the University of Leeds farm, but our you know, fellow sites around the country and around the world, what we can do is to test the options that we're looking for to improve the social outcomes and the environmental outcomes that, that might require help in policy in terms of um, incentives, in terms of how we structure subsidies, in terms of how we might structure taxation uh, or regulation. Uh, but to get those policy innovations right, to get the outcomes that we want, one of the things that I think is important is that we de-risk uh, the impact on farm businesses. So we can use University of Leeds Farm as an example, as a test bed, and we could say, what would happen if we put policy in place that would incentivize farmers to um, dramatically change how they, you know, to use much less irrigation water or to uh, use different crop rotations with much less tillage. We could trial that for several years where we might have be able to apply for research grants from the UK's, um, you know, research funders that would bear the financial risk of those changes to farm businesses and test that out and make sure that we then start to have evidence that there that we will achieve through the proposed policy innovation and through proposed changes to farming practices the benefits that we really want to achieve and then we also have an opportunity to understand 
why those benefits are working or if they're not, what we need to do to adjust. So I think getting the technical and scientific evidence together and making that usable and, and informing farmers how these can help de-risk and improve farm businesses, uh, that, that is probably the biggest role that I see in the policy arena for the type of activities that I've described. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions now, very different questions, but, but unsurprisingly related to the, the situation we find ourselves in at, at the moment with, with COVID-19 um, and various implications in very different ways. So the first question, do you think that the, the current COVID-19 outbreak will affect the global, global food supplies? And in relation to that, do you think actually we'll, we'll, we'll end up switching to eating season, seasonal food grown more locally? Um, I don't want to steal too much of Caroline's thunder tomorrow. So mapping the Leeds food system, I would, uh, she is going to talk about the local food supply system um, within Leeds. But let me comment perhaps more generally on this point about global food supply systems. Um, it has already changed globally dramatically. This is a consequence of the just-in-time delivery that uh, certainly supermarkets around the Northern Hemisphere rely on. Uh, so they draw on food supplies, leaving the field on a very targeted, scheduled way, moving quickly through the food supply chain, arriving just as the shelves need stocking, and the consequence, of course, of a surge in demand in the, in the shopping aisles is um, a very short-term disruption right at the point of retail with bare shelves that we've seen. So then it comes down to the questions of these disruptions are affected by where are stocks held? And this just-in-time system that we have, it's incredibly flexible. It keeps food prices for retail quite low because it doesn't require you know, substantial investment in storage facilities around the, the supply chain. But when we have a shock to the system, there is no resilience, there's no storage in the system. And we can see, you know, consequences backing up now if we think of produce that might be arriving from the Mediterranean basin uh, overnight by cold lorry to our uh, supermarkets, uh, let's say in Yorkshire. Um, then the question becomes immediately, uh, these crops that were scheduled to come out of the field this week, are they coming out of the field? Uh, what has the lockdown in Spain and the burden of disease in Spain done to the farming population, the worker population? Are there people available to get these out of the field and onto the trucks? Then you can just imagine knocking that um, you know, further on, then are the crops being planted, the seasonal crops being planted in part places around the world that will allow those to come out of the field and, and hit the supply chain just at the right time, three, four, or five months from now. So the supply chains are dramatically changing. And I think it will be the current situation. Um, you know, what it is demonstrating to me is that uh, at least in food supplies that we're familiar with in Europe and the Northern Hemisphere, um, they, the businesses are incredibly inventive, incredibly uh, creative in terms of switching supplies and, and making sure that they get uh, maybe not the full breadth of, of grocery stock, but that food supplies are you know, still a, a, a substantial set of items are able to be stocked continuously. Um, and then we have alongside this a complete shutdown in restaurants, pubs, and, and other retail outlets. And then it is a question about how do we make sure that that excess supply is being used and, and isn't being wasted. And that to a large degree, to my knowledge, has been dealt with positively by diverting some of that excess supply that is in fridges and freezers in restaurants, you know, diverting that to vulnerable populations, to care homes, and so on. So these shocks are teaching us, um, so I think some very tough lessons about weaknesses in the system. And I think there will have to be adaptation and uh, there will be, I'm sure, business structures to understand how to make things more resilient um, following uh, the, the pandemic and in the recovery phase. Thank you. 
Um, we, we, we're getting lots and lots of questions. And, and as you say, we've, we've got another talk tomorrow. So I'm going to save the ones around any more detail around behavior to put to Caroline tomorrow. And for those who can't attend tomorrow's talk, we will be recording that as well. So there'll be an opportunity to view that afterwards. Um, I've got a couple more questions just to wrap up with. I'd like to thank everybody for, for joining us today. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all your questions. We, we'll, we've tried to get through as many as possible. And what we will do also is, I think, I think if Steve might have about five minutes more to stay on the chat if, if he can do. But equally, we'll talk to him and, and look at our future communications to see whether we can answer any of your question, is questions in those as well. Um, but just to wrap up with, I had a couple of, of, of questions, one from um, one of our alumni in Indonesia and one of our alumni in Nigeria. Now, clearly, they're, they're very different in terms of climate, but, uh, but both questions are, are the same, which are how, how is the work in, in Leeds applicable to, to, to the areas more, more globally? So I wonder, Steve, if you could just say a bit about how we're using the research in Leeds to, to apply um, to, to, to activity more, more, more widely across the world? Okay, so the, the most direct uh, explanation is that our research farm and the activities of the Institute are networked globally. Uh, for example, the Africa project, uh, we work, we have joint research with field stations in Malawi and Tanzania and in South Africa. And there are examples there where we can do a certain amount of work, for example, on soil management uh, in the UK. Um, uh, but we need also to do parallel work in those climate and economy and farm practice specific sites and regions uh, outside of the UK. Um, but that is a typical way of working that we will work on a, tip, a general problem, let's say diversifying income by trialing new crop species. We may well have, uh, you know, uh, address that question with crops that would be suitable or potentially suitable for innovation in Europe, and then a different suite of crops that will be potentially suitable, let's say, in Indonesia. And then we would carry out that research together and look at what share, what are the general lessons that we learn as we go through that research and innovation, and what are the more country or site specific challenges and opportunities that come up. So there will be some things which are general, for example, water and soil nutrients are going to behave the same um, around the world. They may well depend on temperature and, and climate to a degree, um, but general principles will still apply. Whereas other things like vegetation that is adapted to specific climates, that may well be completely different uh, between these different sites. So it is uh, by networking, and it is by conducting parallel research under different conditions and working collaboratively. Thank you. And a, a final question, which I think is a, is a, a good one to end on. Um, what can you say a bit about what Leeds is doing to educate and inspire school children in the UK and perhaps around the world about smart agriculture? So we have through our undergraduate programs, we do have undergraduate ambassadors that engage with local schools. The Institute itself, uh, we do not have uh, an explicit program uh, for uh, that we administer or that we run for school outreach, but we do contribute uh, information and we do contribute activities to the activities that the university engages in in our local community uh, through our um, you know, science festival in Leeds and um, activities such as that. And one of the opportunities I think that we have as a university is some of our networks, both regionally and globally, uh, for example, working with the Northern Eight universities, these are the other research intensive universities within the region, that would be a really good opportunity to try to get um, you know, greater regional coverage of these types of outreach activities. So we do some of these organized through the university. Um, the Institute contributes to these. We don't have a specific program um, around food and environment, but I like the idea of the potential to develop that um, for school outreach. 
Thank you. Uh, that brings us uh, to the end of the questions we have time for. It, we're, I'm afraid we're out of time now. Um, thank you, Steve, so much for your presentation. And thank you to all our alumni who've taken part today um, and asked so many really probing and really fascinating questions. Um, as I mentioned at the start, uh, please do join us on social media to be part of our big get together, um, Sustainability Month. That's the, the hashtag is LeedsBGT20 or lots of information on our website as well. You can just search for Leeds Alumni Online. Uh, we hope some of you might be able to join us at tomorrow's event that we, we've mentioned already. So please do book on to attend if you haven't. And as I say, if you can't, we, we will send out details so you can view it in your own time in future. 